How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on Climate One, we're talking climate change and civil rights. I'm joined by the Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley, who marched alongside Martin Luther King, Bay Area hip-hop artist and activist Mystic, and Ingrid Brostrom with the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Oppressive heat on Climate One starts now. Reverend Durley, let's begin with you. Uh, You were in the National Mall in 1963 when Dr. King gave his uh, famous speech, and you went back 50 years later. How do you see civil rights and climate change as connected? First of all, let me thank Climate One for this very important discussion at this time. Uh, It's so important because in any movement, there has to be a period of time where we get all of the facts together so that it's not considered fake news, Mm -hmm. where we can come (laughs) together and understand how important this is. In 1963, that was my senior year in college, and we were concerned about the civil and human rights of all individuals. And we we fought a good fight, I thought, and then 50-something years later, it's still the civil and human rights that everyone should have the right to clean air, uh, toxic-free water, and and these kinds of efforts. So we see the analogous between what we were fighting for then and what we've got to fight for now. It is a right of everybody that we have access to these kinds of uh, areas. So we see it now, and particularly in the faith community, where we're beginning to now organize around this And if we can organize by bringing people to another level of awareness, then we can move to the strategy session. That's the foundation of any movement. Mystic, you uh, grew up with a a mother who's an environmental advocate and activist. And how did you come to this? I kind of, I guess you couldn't escape it because you grew up with it, coming to the climate connection. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with my mother here for a long time in San Francisco. She was an activist and an advocate worked with farm workers in the Central Valley in the 80s. She worked with folks um, coming from Nicaragua and Guatemala around asylum. So she was just like always dedicated to people and the world and the environment. And as time has progressed, as, as we have learned more knowledge, as we have gained more facts about what climate change means, not only around the world, but in the communities that are most impacted, which are traditionally more impoverished and are traditionally folks of color that, um, you know, I can't escape getting that information shared with me. It can be as simple as if I had an air freshener in my house that she would explain to me what the toxins were. She would explain to me that I should go buy one where I can put my own essential oils on them. And therefore, it's, it, it's healthier for my house and, and healthier for me. And um, so it was kind of there and something that I was interested in. But when I began working with the Hip Hop Caucus, which is a national and growing international human rights and civil rights and social justice organization started by Reverend Lennox Yearwood um, over 10 years ago, climate change was always part of the platform in terms of connecting it to civil rights and to human rights and to social justice. And so to have the opportunity to travel to other places you know, has pushed me in that direction. And uh, as somebody who really, I know it can be a kind of flag world to say global citizen, but as somebody who who works with children and loves children all around the world, to know that millions of children are being impacted by climate change and will continue to be so, that's what drives me to advocate in this area. Thank you. Ingrid Brostrom, uh, there's a perception that the you know, environmental people who care about our climate change are coastal, Caucasian, et cetera. So tell us what your organization is trying to, to address that hasn't been addressed by sort of the broader environmental groups, bigger environmental groups. Yeah, and, and I think that perception is 
is, is actually very wrong. Um, when you do polling, you actually see that people of color poll the highest mm -hmm. on, on the need to address climate change and address it quickly. And, and it makes sense because um, certain communities are impacted uh, by the same toxic facilities that are causing uh, global warming and climate change. And so, you know, we're working directly with communities in California's Central Valley. Um, it's a lot of farm working communities. It's impacted by um, pesticide applications. It's, it's impacted by fracking operations, refineries. Uh, of course, uh, all of the, the, f the biggest freeways and uh, go right through the Central Valley. And so um, they're inundated with both local pollutants um, from all these facilities and sources, as well as uh, carbon. Um, and so they are getting the double whammy of, of being physically impacted by the local pollution, but they're also going to be impacted first and worse by climate, and they're going to be less resilient. They're going to have less um, money to leave the area. They're going to have less money for air conditioning um, and, and, and other, other ways of, of, of that other communities can be more resilient. We're seeing that certain communities are necessarily going to be more impacted and they have the least resources to deal with those impacts. Plus you understand that many times people have said, why aren't people of color, and particularly in the African American community and Latino community, why aren't they more involved? But you have to understand one thing. People move from a psychological point of survival. And when you've got police brutality, when you've got rent, when you've got educa poor education, when you've got unemployment, those issues that are very bread and butter issues. It's not a matter of people are not concerned about the environment. They've got other pressing issues. And so as long as you can keep that in front of people, you can uh, uh, do the land, you can put different kinds of programs around them, just don't know. And I think that's just why this is so important. Now I know in 40 states, Interfaith Power and Light is really trying to work with the base of people to bring them to a level of understanding what is actually going on. I had no idea about this eight years ago. And I consider myself fairly knowledgeable, but I had highly no educated idea. man. But the climate was not on your radar. It was, it was not on my radar. A lady, she came up to me and said, this is very important. And I didn't pay any attention to her, <laughs> but she, she, she joined the church. And so I started listening to her. Her name. Was, <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, she said, I want to introduce you to my husband. Her name was Jane Fonda. Mm. <laughs> her husband was Ted Turner. So I said, you've got my ear. But, <laughs> but it wasn't about polar bears so much as it, maybe I could get a grant from these people. <laughs> follow the money, right? Yeah, yeah. follow the money. <laughs> but then as I began to get in and look at the devastation, and particularly those that I was called to serve, I began to understand uh, the importance of what it is that we have to do. Then I began to see that there's no incongruence between faith and science and begin to connect the dots and allow people, because people, when they find out that this is a disparaging situation, they will make the appropriate decision. So I got tired of so many major white groups talking about minorities rather than talking with minorities and finding out what's going on in the rivers areas of North Carolina, South Carolina, when Sally and I went down in after Katrina to, with Jim Wallace and to look at those issues. Then it became, then we've got to have that coordinating kind of understanding as to why we go. So is a deliberate effort to say we're going to just uh, disenfranchised people of color in these areas. I, I don't think that so much as, as it's evolved from following the dollar. Let's pick up on that mystic. I mean, environmental organizations know they have a, a diversity problem. They try. Um, wh where do they fall short? Do they, do they not listen enough? Why, why, why is it so hard to bridge that, that gap? I think on the most basic level, it's about who deem certain kind of knowledge worthy, right? And who deems the sanctity, the quality, the purpose of, of lives differently? And so it's one thing as a, 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 you know, a primarily white, you know, environmental justice organizations to try to come to communities of color and show up and say, well, we have things to tell you, right? Mm. And, and, and we have all the answers for you and these are what the solutions are without ever taking the opportunities to say, how is this impacting you and your family and your community? Mm -hmm. What would you like to see the solutions be? And to start to talk about not just that we in communities of color need for the policy to change, but that we also need to be engaged. There's a lot of money in climate change mitigation, right? And adaptation um, as we create uh, more renewable energy sources 
you know, how about in communities that are most deeply impacted that there's educational programs to train people to build solar panels, to install solar panels, to really be engaged. And so I think it can be very well meaning. But when you think about structural hierarchies, and if, you, if, if the perception is that white folks are the leader within this movement and have that higher level of power, and you don't help lift people up, right? Not speak on behalf of people mm -hmm. or for people, but bring them to the table to speak for them, <clears throat> for them, for themselves to shape what the conversation is and not just the conversation, but what those solutions are that need to come. So I think that there has been a lot of outreach, but I think the failure is also like, you come to tell us things. You don't come to, to, to ask us how we're organizing or what we want to do or what we want to see and what we want the future to be. And partnerships are critical. Absolutely, partnerships. absolutely. Um, uh, great societies have mentors, and, but then you come to a partnership where there's a healthy level of respect mm -hmm. of your integrity. And then, then we can really come to the kinds of solutions that are beneficial to everyone. Absolutely. Ingrid Brostrom, uh, 2010, there was a ballot initiative in California funded by two Texas oil companies to roll back the state's primary climate law that was championed by Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. And there was a coalition put together, a billionaire Democrat, George Schultz, a Republican elder statesman, put together the defense of that law. And the reach outreach to the Latino community was decisive in that victory. Then was that a one-time thing, or did that lead to any lasting kind of uh, collaboration that we've heard about here? Well, I mean, that particular law has been particularly frustrating in terms of how it's been implemented. Mm -hmm. And so while we all came together, and, and um, we really did come together with the environmental movement, and I say the environmental movement um, and separating it from the environmental justice movement, which, which mm. my organization considers that we're part of, because we do have different in interests and we do have different ways of looking um, at solutions. But we came together um, with a very wide coalition, and I think um, the upshot of after we protected that law then when the environmental justice communities, the communities of color that are so impacted um, by climate and by tox toxicities, um, when we asked for support to make sure that we did not allow pollution trading as the way to implement that law, it fell on deaf ears. Yeah. So, I mean, it continues to be a, a pretty big divide, and it really came out this year in California's legislature. So, so explain what pollution trading is and why it's uh, so controversial uh, among certain communities. Yeah, but, I mean, pollution trading is what it sounds like. It, it really is the ability to buy and sell pollution rather than reducing it at the source. And why it's so important for environmental justice communities and communities of color um, is if you look at carbon in isolation, then perhaps it doesn't matter where the reductions are happening. But when you recognize that carbon is never emitted by itself, it always uh, is emitted at alongside very toxic air pollution that directly impacts people living next door, then instead of reducing the pollution on site and instead you buy it, from somewhere else, then location really matters. You're not getting the pollution reductions that these communities uh, really need uh, right now. They're, they're being impacted on, on a daily basis. So the, that for a U.S. power company, for example, can save some trees in Brazil, but still keep polluting in Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, et cetera. So they can clean up somewhere far away Correct. and still be dirty at home because it's cheaper uh, to do that. Reverend Durley, you know, talk about the, the, the global view of this. You've traveled overseas quite a bit about how the global justice of what's, what's happening. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting what, what governs the legislative process and how we put regulation or deregulation. Can you imagine in 2017 that China now will move ahead of America in terms of, of regulations, in terms of the fossil burning fuel and others? And I think that this is why I think I, I heard Sally Bingham say earlier, and I've always said, where there's a moral side to this whole area, and America has to understand the moral interpretation of the climate and environmental justice movement, whereas uh, when, we, when we start talking about re instituting fossil burning fuels, when we start talking about the fracking in other areas, when we start talking about implementing nuclear plants, 
again, for the profit motif, even China and I are saying, wait a minute, let's back because our quality of life now is, 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 is uh, being degenerated. So we've got to come back and ask the moral question, how do we not, how do we put a, a, uh, the quality of life for all Americans in this country? And when we can bring that effort to the, uh, bring that initiative to the forefront, I think we've got a grounds to then begin to put the appropriate kind of legislation in place but it's got to be, and I've said this many times when I'm talking about climate, it's, we've got to move it to a gut level issue. Right now it's not hitting people in the gut. It's hitting those of us in this room tonight. But the average person has not really grasped that. And that's our real challenge now to, 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 to make that this is something that now is not in the future, but right now in our effort. I try to talk to young pastors about how critical it is to take it from their sphere of influence to let people in their communities know that this is a now issue and when we can join forces then we can move and to two major groups the business groups and the legislators the people now we're as as, as mystic has said we're getting a, a grasp on it but that's what's going to be really critical and right now i don't sense that urgency among the grassroots people how about after harvey Irma, Irma mm. maria did that, you know, there was snowing in Atlanta, uh, some of the strange weather yeah, we've yeah. seen. Has, does that drive the, like, oh, wait, maybe this is happening now in my lifetime. It's not just about faraway places and faraway times. Yeah, I think the reality is, is, is becoming more and more pronounced, but it's how those of us that's in, in this room understand that and interpret that because they'll say this is a temporary and the snow is melted and we'll rebuild uh, St. Thomas or Saint, and, and it'll be business as usual. And I think right. that that's where we've got to sustain an effort of the critical and of what, what it is now. And once people get that, the masses will always bring forth the change. Right now, that's what we're working toward, I think. Mystic, you're working on a voter registration, voter engagement yeah. with, with a, the Hip Hop -hip Caucus. Uh, during the, the 2016 election, 60% of eligible voters in this country voted. Mm -hmm. That's up a little bit from 59% in 2012, down a little bit from 2008 when the exuberance of uh, Barack Obama drove a lot of people to the right. polls. Uh, why don't more people vote? What, what could be done to get more people engaged out to vote? If they Certainly, if they don't think it matters, that last election ought to show that elections matter. Um. And, you know, as the kind of data has been disaggregated about who voted and how people voted and the percentages, mm -hmm. you know, in connection with the structure of race or um, class, um, I think on the most basic level, it's frustrating when you vote and you don't get what you voted for, right? Or you vote, but then the election is stolen. Right. I'm a little bit older, so I'm like I, I voted in elections where that's not where that's not how it was supposed to turn out, that there was so much kind of a systemic approach to excluding people from being able to vote because they had been incarcerated or, you know, whatever it may have been, removing people from roles. And so I think there's the frustration there. But when we talk about bringing more folks to the table to vote, and especially at the caucus, we're very interested in, in, in civic engagement among young people, right? Um, as somebody who advocates for children and works with children and youth, like I firmly believe that, that, that children and youth are our leaders, right? They we, need to be involved in, in the process, right? You think locally, too, is a better place. If you're disaffected with national, go local. Absolutely, absolutely vote there it matters. local. And we're nonpartisan at the Hip Hop Caucus. So we're not about telling you who to vote for or what to vote for. It's about get the knowledge, understand who the people are who are running for these positions and what that impact is on your community, who, who funds them. And so in that sense, what's happening locally, like your school board, you know, and your attorneys, but then of course your mayor and your governor, maybe voting for the president doesn't seem like it has the largest impact. Although I believe after this current administration that there is no way that we are going to be able to go back. I mean, I would hope that we will not go back to a, a point in a position where we say it does not matter to vote, but it's like, let's engage more young people to push, to push that through, to lead it, and let's force people who are currently in power 
who we've put in those positions to actually do what they said they were going to do. Hold to trans them. Yeah, to hold, hold them, them accountable. accountable. Uh, to trans help transform communities driven by community solutions. I'd like to go to our uh, lightning round and ask each of our guests uh, first a true or false and then an association question. So first, true or false, and then I'll mention a brief noun and ask them for the first thing that pops into your mind, unfiltered. <laughs> um, so <laughs> here's some fun. Uh, so... Mystic, true or false, hip-hop has a misogyny problem. True. Reverend Durley, uh, environment is not a relevant term to many Americans. True. Ingrid Brostrom, environmental justice advocates sometimes obstruct progress making, by making the perfect the enemy of the good. False. <laughs> also for Ingrid Brostrom, some environmental groups help corporations greenwash. I hope not. Uh, I'm going to mention the association part of our lightning round here at Climate One. I'm going to mention a phrase or a noun, and you'll mention the first thing that comes to your mind. Ingrid Brostrom, polar bears. <laughs> Important, but so are people. Mm. Uh, Mystic, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Si se puede, right? Like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm an educator, right? So to, I'm one of those, let's do yes. Create your environments for yes. Reverend Durley, Tesla. Wave of the future. Ingrid Brostrom, uh, fracking. It's a dying industry that's still doing a lot of harm. Mm. Last one, Reverend Durley, Donald Trump. A catalyst who will make America look at itself. Mm. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a round for getting through that. Um, <laughs> It's one of the best Donald Trump answers I've ever heard. Right? It is. It is. Um, Ingrid Brostrom, I want to talk about the courts. Some scientists believe that dispensing facts about climate change and atmospheric carbon isn't really getting through to people, and they're looking to the courts to do some things that the federal government has not done, just as civil rights, a lot of important things happened in the courts. Tell us what's happening in the, in the courts on climate. Well, the courts have not been friendly thus far. I mean, there is mm. a series of cases, um, you know, basically trying to hold companies liable for, for the climate change that they were causing and actual damage to communities. Um, and, and they all failed. Um, the courts were basically punting and putting it back on the federal government and saying, this is who's gonna regulate these climate pollutants, not, not us. Um, so we've had a series of failures on that front. Um, but there is a um, renewed energy and focus on a different type of litigation, and that's really recognizing that governments in general hold natural resources in trust, and the atmosphere can be seen as a natural resource. That's very important for our future generations and the ability of them to, to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've actually seen some progress um, in this new legal theory, and um, I believe next year there'll, there'll, uh, there'll be more litigation on that front. Um, there are right now in the world over 700 different climate cases. Um, Cal uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. is the home of the vast majority of those cases, um, and so definitely litigators, um, both here and internationally, are trying to figure out different legal theories um, that we can test in the courts. Um, and so it definitely is uh, being tested now, and we'll see. Um, We'll see what happens. Um, me personally, um, I haven't had a great deal of faith in the court system divorced from other political and organizing avenues. My organization in particular, we organize. Um, is the biggest part of what we do is we organize communities and we do policy work and we also litigate. Um, but the court system itself is designed to remove issues from the hands of the communities that are impacted and putting it on elite attorneys and their different legal theories. Um, and so with my organization, we always try to figure out how do we bridge that divide? How do we make sure that the communities that are impacted are part of the strategy? So even if we have a court case, we don't leave the communities there and say, hey, we'll come back in, in five, 10 years and we'll give you an answer if we can help you or not. Um, that's not 
I don't think, the, the way we're actually going to solve our problems. So it really does have to be, um, we have to be getting more voters. We need to be changing the decision makers. We need to be organizing the residents. We need to be changing the laws in Sacramento and Washington. And let's have a court case. Um, so that's where I think we're going to get those victories. And it's not going to be the courts by themselves. Reverend Durley, a lot of environmental activism targets oil and fossil fuel companies as, as the villains. Um, and yet they sell a product that we all burn and use for our, our lifestyles. Everybody listening to this today used fossil fuels today. Um, are we complicit? Is it, you know, do we need to, uh, are we complicit in this or is it simply that fossil fuel companies are evil and we've been um, uh, passive victims of this? Well, certainly as long as we continue to, to burn fossil fuel and all this, we are complicit. But we've, we've become a very comfortable nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, be, we like our, uh, our heat just right and our air just right and our water just right. And I never thought when I was growing up that we'd be drinking bottled water. <laughs> uh, but we are. So we like things that are comfortable. So consequently, when it comes to uh, the companies are going to do what they think that they can get away with to make money. I never thought growing up with an outdoor toilet and poor, the oldest of eight, I said, when I finally made enough money, I was going to buy me a decent car. And I didn't care who, what it meant. And I made enough money and I bought me an S550 Mercedes. And I said, now look at me, I finally made it. And then as I started thinking about the environment and polluting all this. Now I drive a hybrid. Mm. Now, the companies now are moving toward automated cars, uh, uh, autonomous driving cars. Mm. They're moving toward more electric cars. Mm. So when we used to do a thing called boycott, if they don't do it, let's not buy from that product. So I think when the, when the public starts saying, we're not going to buy those large automobiles, we're not going to do this, then I think that uh, uh, we'll find the, uh, the, the industry beginning to, to work uh, to cut back on many of the atrocities that they've placed upon us. But as long as we continue to be, you use the term complicit, why should they change? Mm. And some Buddhists might say you have to have that card in order to give it up. You have to, it's easier, you know, a lot of people, you can't tell someone who's never had that fancy car, don't have what I, oh, okay. you had it and then you gave it up. Yeah, that's true, that, yeah, that's a great point. Mm.